just to start with, can you just you know, tell us a little bit about yourself? Like, where are you from? You know, what's kind of your background yeah. Yeah, as far as adventure goes? Oh, yeah. So, I'm Mass. I'm 22 years old, and I'm from southern Denmark. Um, and I've been living in Copenhagen for now, for about two years now. Um, but I've not really been there that much. I I travel around 250, 300 days a year. Wow. Um, <laughs> and a lot of it is with work, or most of it is actually work. So I work as a photographer, um, drone pilot, and also do some, cinem- some cinematography. Um, but I really, I, I, I try at least the best I can to go on as many ad- as as many adventures as possible and, and the more I can mix the adventures with work the better oh, yeah. so um, the same uh, kind of happened here I've, I'm, I've been in Greenland for a good five weeks now doing different jobs I go here quite a lot and um, I finally had some time in between to do something that I wanted for a while and it was the Arctic Circle trail and it was brilliant timing because it was like it's not too cold now we are at the end of march um and i thought heck i'll just um have this week um booked in the calendar for when i'm here and i'll try and make it work cool and what is it about the arctic circle trail that uh, kind of captured your imagination so i think for anyone starting out doing something they never tried before it's just always easier to to go about doing something that's kind of already there Mm -hmm. or at least a planned route or something that is more or less easy to go to there's a lot of guidance online and um, also just the fact that there's huts all the way there's a lot of people passing by so you're quite safe Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's of course not easy Oh, it's not. It's not like it's a. I wouldn't say that it's necessarily for just beginners. You kind of have to know a little bit about being in the outdoors, but it's comparably to a lot of like other places and just doing it in the middle of nowhere. It's really nice to be to start out with and a really good way to to do something uh, of that kind of length and expedition style stuff. Okay. And so, what what sort of what did you encounter on your trip? What was the you know, temperature, wind, climate type? So we were quite we were quite lucky. I mean, we I think we the, the coldest we encountered. We, we started out in about fifteen minus no sorry minus fifteen minus seventeen, but from there it just went up all the way. So I think <laughs> which we, is unusual yeah, for this time of year. Quite unusual. Yeah. Um, of course, we we didn't count on completely cold weather. Because it was, of course, end of March, but we, I think we had days with like minus ten, minus five, which is quite, quite unusual. And it's also, I mean, there wasn't quite a lot of snow, so we also had to, I guess, you can start a lot of places. Um, but we started at Kelleville, the old radar station in Gangsuswak, um, and we chose to do that because there wasn't really any snow from the airport in Gangsuswak out to the radar station. So instead of hassling around for a whole day on the just the yeah dirt and tarmac and stuff, we just thought, okay, might as well just drive out there first. Because mm. you guys were on skis and dragging pulkas, yeah. Yes. So we were three three people, mm-hmm. um, and we had two pulkas. So that was kind of to to just have a, we could circulate the pulkas, but it ended up just two of us pulled all the way, and then. We had a girl who just started up skiing, so she was just having a lighter backpack, and that way we made it work. Um, because then yeah, it it ended up being the best kind of way to do it, mm-hmm. uh, since it we we did it in in quite an okay tempo, I'd say four days is okay for the trip, especially if you're dragging pokers, and it just worked out the best way that we were pulling the two of us. And so four, three people, roughly how much did you have on your pulkas? How, how much did they weigh when you started? So we definitely didn't pack light. I brought camera gear because I was going for a job here in Sesimut as well. Uh, and we had a lot of just, 
I guess, extra food. Well, it ended up being extra food. Of course, initially it wasn't. It was because we wanted to do it in five days, um, or even. Well, we wanted to do it in four or five days, and then we had food for an additional day. If it's okay, we didn't make it in five, or we were snowed in, whatever. We had food for six days. Yeah. Um, which ended up being a lot extra, um, and then. I guess we also had uh, a tent, mm. but that was more for safety measures. So I think that is important. And I, I think we had sleds. I think we calculated that each sled was around f- 55, 60 kilos. Mm, when you started, yeah. Yeah, <coughs> possibly a bit more. Um, okay. We don't really, we didn't really weigh it. We just ca- calculated all the stuff we brought to Gangasusak and the overweight. Uh, and yeah okay so so, probably probably more (laughs) because it was heavy (laughs) so uh so you said you bought a tent for safety so does that mean you slept in the huts along the way we did uh sleep in the huts along the way and um that was also the plan all along the way i think the tent was only just for safety measures if anyone falls and we have to do uh camp right there on the spot because someone's broken a leg I don't know Mm. or I mean if we're snowed in or it's stormy or something like that or if we it's just getting dark and we didn't make it or we didn't find the hut Mm. Um, but in terms of that I would say that after now doing it we had perfect conditions and it wasn't hard finding the huts there's a lot of tracks along the way Um, but yeah it's I would say that a tent is also a good thing to bring if there's other people in the huts which was something we of course encountered as well because the huts are available for everyone and we went from a uh, we started on a friday and we ended up in susimir on a monday which meant that we were traveling over the weekend which of course meant a lot of locals are going in, into um yeah out onto the track um to hunt or mm-hmm. just to go for a family trip yep so we actually uh, met both people in the canoe center and in our halfway hut which i can't remember the name of is it the lake house or no before that one just like before, yes just yeah. before you're going up the hill yeah so we ended up being eight people in that hut which Ooh, that, that would have been cozy yeah that's cramped <laughs> um but i mean it wasn't that bad and i guess out there you rather just want to make it work than want to pinch up the yeah. tent <laughs> definitely also i mean it is it was pleasant it was nice meeting yeah. people nice being locals they were doing of course they uh, doing they brought a lot of food because they went on snowmobiles so we had some food with them we shared a few drinks uh, we had a oh yeah some of the extra weight was a whiskey so <laughs> we shared important things whiskey with them um um oh i also have to mention that we also brought uh, petrol, mm. petroleum mm-hmm. for the huts because you can heat up the huts. Yep. And um, we decided that we rather want to drag a little bit extra and then be able to heat up the huts. Yep. But then when you're um, meeting people along the way in the huts, they already heated up the huts. So we ended up actually having quite a lot of excess petroleum, but we then left some of it in the hut for the next, oh, yeah, year, cool. I guess. Yeah. And generally, I think the huts are really well equipped. Um, of course, some of them are more used than others, but you will find that a lot of the time there would be excess petroleum or excess gas. I mean, there's even toilets mm. and toilet paper because oh, wow. a lot of the people <laughs> that go there on snowmobiles, they, of course, bring a lot of stuff because they it's easy for them. And I guess it's always, if you're leaving a hut, you might as well just leave mm. some of the extra stuff. For next people the advantages of doing it in winter <laughs> over <Yeah>. summer <laughs> exactly cool um so for navigation uh, i'm again there's not much snow this year compared to normal but did you see the cairns or were you just following the dog sled slash snowmobile tracks or um we brought a garmin inreach mm-hmm. both for navigation uh but also just for safety yep because there's uh, 
no signal along the road, uh, along the track. Um, so we used that a little bit, but mainly just through my phone. Mm. I used okay. it, and I really didn't use it that much because we were, as you said, there's not that much snow. A lot of people has have been driving back and forth on the track for the last, uh, I guess, few months. Um, so there's just one big track all the way, and it's clear to see which one is the main track. Um, and then if I ever were in doubt, I just checked my GPS. Mm, okay. Um, but generally, we were, I think, quite lucky because it was just good visibility, tracks along the way, really clear. Um, but otherwise, we had brought compass and um, brought maps as well. You can yep. buy maps that are just for the route and also a little handbook. So we brought a bunch of extra stuff mm-hmm. that we ended up not really needing because we just follow along the tracks. But of course, we had it for mm. safety. Also, like in a normal year, I mean, there would typically be more snow and you would have continual snowfalls as well, exactly. which would cover the tracks or wind, which would then just blow the snow yep. as well. So yep. this year is a little... A little unusual, yeah. But um, so you, you talked a bit about earlier about um, you know it not being a, a completely difficult route for being so remote. Uh, mm. But what, what's your previous experience in doing winter trips like this? So uh, I, I'm probably not the best guy uh, to uh, to ask this because I just started out. I've only been skiing for. Uh, just a little under two months. Oh, wow. Okay. It's the first time I really put on skis. And that was for a uh, similar expedition in Norway, in Jotunheimen, where we went for a 115 kilometer uh, trip with Polkas. Uh, mm-hmm. However, I was just walking with my camera back and I was uh, photo- photographing uh, to a couple that are going to... Um, do a new route over the Greenlandic ice cap. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of their training trip for the ice cap and they invited me along because they heard that I wanted to do the Arctic Circle Train. I was like, "Mm, might as well want to train some skis, don't you? (laughs) And um, so the first, I just went straight to Norway, bought skis there and we went out first day on a, it was only like a 10 15 kilometers a day but mm-hmm. that was kind of when I just had to learn it mm-hmm. um, and that trip in general prepared me a lot for this trip because we were also just in tents and it was deep snow mm. so quite a lot different but also good way to know what you can actually encounter if it isn't hot uh, and crazy weather or oh, not crazy weather but cra- weather like we've had here in Greenland yeah. for the last few months so is that where you would have learned a little bit about uh, temperature management with the layers and stuff like that? Because yeah. that is a... In Norway, it was quite different. It was We started off in crazy minus 20, a lot of wind, even stormy weather, whiteouts. Um, and we, like, for the trip like this, you just want to have a really good layering system and then you want to be able to have, a like, a... A down jacket you could grab quickly mm-hmm. from your poker um, and I also learned a lot about packaging food like having just all my food pre-planned for the day mm-hmm. so I, we don't really eat lunch we just eat calories chocolate um, bars different kind of not energy drinks but like um, different kind of um, like we mix in the like um electrolytes and, oh, yeah. and, and some caffeine and stuff that we mix in our water for drinking so we have a lot of stuff that we just take quickly on the way so it's always important to keep moving so you don't get too cold and then when you actually have a bigger break you just put on the down jacket but uh, for that matter we we really didn't really have bigger breaks than five minutes possibly ten minutes mm. but we just had quite a few and that way we could do with just having the same clothes on the whole day. And then whenever we got to the hut, get all the wet, sweaty clothes off. If it was, sometimes it wasn't. But um, yeah, that's important to get uh, some dry clothes on and warm clothes. 
um, yeah. Hmm. So, okay. So out of all of the, the stuff that you, you packed, uh, to take with you to Greenland, um, kind of what were, what were the essentials? Yeah. And is there anything you bought that you thought afterwards that, okay, perhaps we didn't need that? Mm, so we did bring a rifle mm. along the trip. I was go doing the trip with two local guys from Nuuk. Um, and we thought we might as well bring a rifle in case, but I think we definitely found out that that wasn't really necessary. Uh, so that was one thing we didn't have to bring another time. I think we did bring quite a lot of like too much petrol mm-hmm. or petroleum um, and then I also I mean it really depends a lot on what you're doing and how you like how fast you're going um, but I we should have brought a little bit less clothes maybe mm-hmm. uh, not that we had a lot but just you don't really need one more than one extra pair of everything mm-hmm as long as it's you can keep it dry um and then we had a bit just too much of uh the like the this energy like pole like what's it called the stuff you mix in your water we just had we should have just pre-packaged that instead of having it in the big packs you buy okay yeah because we had too much weight from that um so i think the the thing the takeaway is that Everything should be pre-packaged, and if you're going as a team, put like all the things you're bringing should be out on the floor before heading out, so that you know that you're not bringing like two shovels, mm. because we brought two shovels uh, and stuff like that. A lot of things that we could just have used one of instead of bringing two, mm. and that's because we, everyone had to do work and we arrived on different times, so mm. we didn't really have time to do the gear checkup we knew that we had all the gear we needed but yep. we ended up having a lot of excess gear because we didn't like everyone was like oh I'll, probably i'll just bring this just to make sure yeah and it then, wasn't a time to coordinate yeah. yeah yeah so okay so there wasn't anything that you wished you'd had that you didn't bring you were well prepared in that respect yeah i think um especially since doing that norway trip in terms of food i already had the food plan um, and then, of course, it's just a matter of having good headlamps, extra batteries, power banks, there's no power along the way. Um, yeah, lighters. I mean, we did uh, we did use a multi-fuel burner mm-hmm. because when it gets too cold, you cannot, like, you cannot be sure that your gas will be working. Yeah. So it's better to use um, a multi-fuel burner where you can buy lots of different types of... Um, fuel for it um, and we also so um, but you also need to make sure that you have your lighter or your um, matches matches yeah. that are either dry or just keep your lighters warm yeah. uh, that's the stuff you always end up when you end up back in the hut you find out that uh, oh Oops. the lighter <laughs> has been in on the polka all day and it's completely frozen and we cannot light uh, or turn on the oven so m- matches i would say is uh, one thing that yeah that was nice we brought a lot of them as well yeah so that we had uh, always be able to light the fire or turn the heat on so your pockets must have been bulging with camera batteries and yeah, yeah all yeah. that sort of stuff because all of that needs to be kept warm that's it as you're that's going it. cool um so you mentioned also uh, meeting a lot of locals along the way. So roughly how many people, are dog sledders, snowmobilers, do you think, just you know, a guesstimate, did you meet along the way in four days? I would say we probably met around... So from, of course, when you're starting out in Gang Susuak, you have some traffic. Um, but it's mainly in Gang Susuak, not from where we started. Mm. But we, we did see a few people that... I think we um, had just been there, to, like just arrived before us that we were going out, and then I think we saw uh, like a good five, yeah, five to seven people a day, mm. and then the last day we were close to the Simiot, and especially also the 
like the two actually the two first day we didn't see that many and then as closer we got to Sisimiut we saw more people and especially because it was the weekends mm. we saw a lot of people um on out the Sunday because that was where we were closer to Sisimiut and a lot of people had been hunting and stuff mm. so they, were they mostly on snowmobiles because Sisimiut yeah. is the snowmobile capital it's of uh, we only only people on snowmobiles yeah um yeah did you run into anybody else on the trail on skis or snowshoes? Yeah, or? we did run into two Polish guys. They were just walking. Mm. You've heard of them? You saw them? I met, met them? them, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they should arrive in a couple of days. Yeah, they're arriving probably in two This weekend, two, yeah. yeah. And then we met a big crew of four people dragging polkas as well. Hmm. We, we, it, it was a weird mix of it. one Dane one Norwegian guy, one German girl, and one Latvian guy. I wow, think. fantastic multicultural group. <laughs> or was he Scottish? He was probably not, no, he was not even Norwegian, he was Scottish. Like, it was really like a mixed group. Yeah. Um, so we ran into those guys. But I think that was actually it for hikers. Mm. We didn't see a lot. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. So overall, what was the highlight for you? I think the it was quite. There was one specific moment where you're kind of passing f- over the lake. Mm, you look behind and you're kind of walking away from Gangsusuak area, which is quite flat. And then you're like wa- like walking into the high mountains, or at least higher mountains of the Sisimiut area, and that was quite special to see. Uh, and just generally, I think, of course, day one is uh, it's always tough getting started, and you gotta find the motions. And we did forty-four kilometers the first day, which and we did four kilom. Oh, sorry, we did four hours in complete darkness. Mm, wow! Uh, so that was a really, really tough day. But it's also the day where we're like walking in with the northern lights and. Just the day where you're pushing yourself because we found out, okay, we might as well reach the canoe center because then we could actually, the next few days are shorter and we could make it in four days. So already day one, we thought we, maybe we should do this in four days, right? Um, But it was, of course, really tough walking in darkness, but it's also quite magical that you're just, after such a, like a 10 hour day, you're still walking and you got the northern lights and you just, pushing the last bit and then you finally arrive at the hut uh, and it's just epic uh, to have a day like that and you reach it and, and yeah and so somebody had already warmed it up for you had they uh, actually there was a um, someone f- like a few guys from the children's home mm. of the Simeon, I think but they kind of center is so big that we just got a whole own room ah yeah so it wasn't warm unfortunately but they're really nice they already they could uh, give us some water to mm. start off with. And one thing I didn't mention is that along all the huts are more or less placed along uh, water sources, which is really brilliant. Because even in winter, we didn't even have to melt snow. We mm. could just uh, follow along the springs. Um, because each hut, at least the huts we were at, there was always a spring nearby. Yeah. And uh, most springs, you, we didn't even need an axe. You just need your boots. And um, if you, you kind of learn it quite quickly, that you have to find the wetter spot, and then you can break like a good 10 or 15 centimeters of the layer. And then mm. you can actually scoop up water with just um, your cup, and then you scoop it into your water bottles. And then you end up with a good water supply quite quickly. And mm. like probably... 20 times faster than melting, melting snow. snow yeah um so that's one thing that i was quite surprised with but also brilliant mm. which also meant that we used a lot less gas yeah so we oh sorry um we had uh, like a cleaned um, petrol yeah we could uh, probably have done with half the amount we had mm. but i mean but if you got to melt snow which is what exactly. you, know, you expect then yeah, uh, yeah. And that might also be, I wonder if that's just because this year has also not had so much snow and that kind of thing, that perhaps the ice is yeah. not as thick as what it would be in a normal I year. I think Canoe Center, you would always be able to find water, mm. but the other um, huts we were at, 
I don't think you necessarily would be able mm. to find water. But Canusenda has a really big spring. Yeah. Um, so I think that should always kind of be accessible, at least with an axe. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if you have an axe or just a small axe, I wouldn't. I think it's a good idea to bring one because if you can get water from a spring, you'll have an hour or two hours more sleep, which exactly. is worth it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, okay, so uh, highlights. What about animals? Did you spot any animals along the way? Yeah, we didn't actually see that many. We saw, I think, a total of five reindeers, hmm. uh, perhaps six, um, and then one Arctic fox. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Not that many. Well, it might also be because the hunters are out as well, so they're, yeah. they're so not they're, stupid. <laughs> um, I think both it's warmer than it is normally, yeah. so they have their winter fur on, so they tend to move higher up um, and I mean we just keep along the trail but the trail is busy I guess you don't necessarily see them close to the trail always if no. there's a lot of people that are going by Yeah. so I think different measures meant that we didn't see that many Yeah. but in general like the highlights as I said is just walking along and you just have these long days and after the first two three hours it's just you get into rhythm mm. Of course, you're looking a lot at the track because you're also just having to move on. But uh, it's just brilliant just walking. No signal, no nothing. You just have your water, your snacks. You go, you have a, like, you end up not talking that much mm. because you're walking for so many hours. But you also, then you have a few chit chat. You kind of figure out something in your head and you talk back and forth. And then you have an hour silence and you're just walking, looking around. That's brilliant. Yeah. It's really, I think, not a lot of experiences like that are easy to come by these days mm. because it's very where you get signal. Yeah. Even in Norway, we were doing that. There was signal along the way a lot. Mm. So here it's really nice just to be isolated. Completely cut off. But still feeling really safe because yeah. it's just a lot of people are out there. Mm. And, I mean, there's shows are just general local like generally the locals are really keen on helping you if there's like you're always waving to anyone passing by yeah and they would stop in a second if you were signaling that something is wrong yeah and that's just really nice to know that you're walking for so long and you it is of course tough uh and you're using a lot of energy so the fact that you can uh Rest assured that someone was close by any time, even mm -hmm. though you're feeling like you're in the middle of nowhere. That's uh, that's mm. always nice, and it makes a trip like that just a bit more pleasant. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you still needed to carry your uh, locator beacon or your uh, yeah, yeah. So, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, um, that's just yeah. Of course, we had the Garmin in reach with the that. Both does the um, what you call it, navigation, the but it signaling, also yeah. does SOS. Yeah. Cool. Okay. What about challenges? Was there any? So there's two um, steep, steep ascents along the way. Yeah. Um, one of them we had early morning on our third day, and that was, I mean, that was skis off because a lot of the, I just skis off and spikes on because it was just icy uh, or dirt <laughs> because it's the only kind of way that people can move up on their uh, snowmobiles mm. so of course it's it's been what's it called torn up torn up yeah. for, for from the last few weeks and since there hasn't been any new snowfall it's been even more mm. torn up and icy so that was like a good hour hour and a half of just pure pure fighting pulling those sleds pulling up. the sleds <laughs> yeah um and then as you get close to the simulate like uh, a good 10 kilometers before you reach the city there's a really long one as well mm -hmm. and that one i did with skis half the way um, but then my skins unfortunately fell off so i boot packed the last way mm. but it's again Generally, the, the the track is uh, quite flat, mm -hmm. so it's also kind of nice that you have 
these challenges um, along the way so that it's not just a walk in the park. Yeah. Because otherwise, in the winter, you're walking a lot on the legs, which is really nice, really pleasant, especially if you're not the best ski in the world. It's quite doable. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's also really cool that you get just a little bit of a challenge <laughs> along the way, right? Exactly. And especially because we took the like the first really long ascent in the morning mm. we were energized and ready and from the rest of the day was was more or less just um, straight with little mm. ascents and descents yeah um, which meant that I mean it's just a really good day because you started off with a um, successful the uh, ascending that really long uh, I don't know. You, you know the name of it. You know what I mean. Wait, between which huts is it's it? It's from there where you get to the fjord, the one hut where we were sleeping with. Uh, yeah. So yep. you have to. It's a long, long. Yeah, ascent. the long, long, long one up yeah. onto the. Kind of on the side hill. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So that was. I think that was. Even possibly you have an amazing even, view once you get up there. Yeah. <laughs> and then you look back. You look at the hut, and you realize, holy sh. <laughs> <laughs> Climbed a long way. <laughs> yeah, it's actually really, really far up. Um, but you don't... Because we saw the day before the snowmobiles going down. Mm. Which, of course, they're going quite fast and moving quite fast. And it's way easier. So it's like, ah, okay. It looks steep and all, but it doesn't look that long. Mm. But I tell you, it was, it was long with the podcast. <laughs> all right. So final, final questions. You know... Um, what advice or thoughts would you have for others um, that might be cons- considering the trip in the winter? Hmm. So, um, I guess I would call us more or less happy amateurs. Mm. I think a lot of people are probably better prepared than we are, so I'm not giving out like the probably a lot of the advice I could give out is that like common knowledge, but I guess. Being well prepared is is never a bad thing, mm. um, and just doing a good gear check and packing the polkas right is really essential. Um, of course, because we just flew in from Nuuk uh, and we just had the simple polkas, we just packed with our duffel bags. Mm-hmm. But um, it's really important to think about weight distribution um, because actually the day we were climbing that high one was the first day I didn't have a backpack. I put it on the polka and it was just rolling around the entire way up. Mm. Really frustrating. So that's one of the things that good gear check and making sure that you pack the polkas right can make the whole difference. And um, then I would say that uh, that the easier, you, that, that the better you pre-pack your food and the better you... Um, like you have, it's really important to, that you bring like uh, only uh, what's it called thermo bottles, like uh, like thermoses, therm- yeah. uh, so that you can keep your like liquid all, liquid. Yeah, <laughs> all the water will freeze. Also, even though it's warmer than you anticipate, it will still freeze. So having good system for keeping your water warm and liquid is uh, really important. Mm. Yeah, and then I mean, have fun. I guess. Yeah. Make sure that uh, that you have a backup plan if the huts are filled. But otherwise, the huts are brilliant, and it's really nice that you can get in and heat up and try your stuff. Cool. Yeah. Final thoughts. Hmm. I want to do it again. I want to do it faster. <laughs> I want to do it way faster. I think uh, four days is fast, but I think it's no. It would be fun to do it like in a crazy two day thing. Mm-hmm. So that's, I guess, that's the next plan. And then I want to do it in the summer, mm. but possibly with a tent because I yeah. think there's it's a bit more cramped in the summer. I guess there's a bit more traffic. Yeah, yeah. That's also nice because a tent gives you freedom to camp anywhere. You don't that's have it. you don't have that's to camp. be at the, at the huts. Yeah. And I guess winter the huts are really nice because you have a warm shelter you can dry your stuff but in summer it's a different thing right yeah it's yeah. uh 
like hot can he hot can he maybe even feel a bit trapped because you have to deal possibly with other people which yeah. is nice but sometimes you're also just looking for an escape <laughs> right? exactly you're actually out there to just enjoy it and be by yourself yeah yeah awesome well thanks very much Mess, for of course. Being the first guest on our podcast. Yeah, I hope, I hope this goes live. We never know. <laughs> no, thank you so much for taking the time. And I know you have to get to the airport. So. Ah, no stress. No stress. I thank you. Think so. no. Cool.